this Sunday after Easter is often known as Cannonball Sunday. And what that means is that you could probably fire a cannonball and not, and not hit anyone. That would be literally true today. It's a delight to see all you folks on this wonderful day. Hope that you will stay around after the service for Coffee Fellowship. In the service, you will see that there are opportunities for responses, and I would encourage you to just say those responses in the privacy of your home and after I offer the beginning part of that prayer. You'll note our call to worship. It is responsive. Peace be with you. Jesus stands among us. Peace, Peace be with you. With you. Yeah. The risen Lord is here. Let us pray. Almighty and eternal God, the strength of those who believe and the hope of those who doubt, may we who have not seen have faith and receive the fullness of Christ's blessing, who is alive and reigns with you. Amen. You'll note that our first hymn is hymn 245, That Easter Day with Joy Was Bright. Greetings on this second Sunday of Easter. This morning I will offer a prayer of confession for all of us, and then there will be a time of silence for you to shape your own prayers. Our assurance of pardon today is a little different. It will be the song, We Are Forgiven, which we will sing after our time of silence. And the words and music are in the bulletin, and this is a song we've sung many times in worship, and I hope you'll remember it. It's one of those beautiful songs that will play and play in your mind, and you can take it with you today. So let us pray. God of wonders and grace, we bring before you the ways we have fallen short of your glory. We have let fear have its way with us, and we have forgotten to trust that you are always with us. We have not embraced the wonder of Christ risen and have been slow to rejoice and give thanks for the amazing gift to the world, Jesus, our risen Lord. We have walked amidst the beauty of spring and have not seen your providence in every detail. Forgive us, set us on a new path and help us walk closer with you, O oh loving God. May it be so.
My friends, this is such good news. These are the waters of grace, of God's forgiveness, of God's love. This is the peace of Christ that we are to share with one another. The peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. Please share. Be with you. Be with you. Peace. Peace. Be with you. Be with you. Be with you. My picture disappeared. Everybody's well. Hey. Hey, John. Hey, John. Hey, John. Hey, John. Hey, with you all. Hey, John. 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 Bruce, you know, Liza. Hi, Pieces. Pieces. Hi, Pieces. Hi, Pieces. Hi, Pieces. Hi, Pieces. Hi, <laughs> the whole screen. Yeah, let's we'll see. There is a way. Oh. Grateful to all of you who have continued to contribute to the work of the church during this time of social distancing. There are several ways for all of us to do that now. You, of course, can mail your contributions to the church. The mail still works. Or you can go to our webpage, lexprez.org, and click on Giving or Donate Now. And with a few clicks and added information, like your credit card or debit card, you can donate online. I did that yesterday, and it was much easier than I imagined it would be. You can also donate through Realm. Just go to Giving, and you will be prompted what to do next. We're so grateful to the Finance Committee that made these electronic means available to the church and that they are now in place. So now please join me as I offer a prayer for the gifts given. And at the conclusion of the prayer, we will switch over and we will all sing, praise God from whom all blessings flow. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you for the blessings you give to us for our food, our health, our strength of body and soul. We are grateful that we have gifts to share for the work of your kingdom. In this strange and frightening time, help us to see ways that we can dedicate ourselves and our resources to serve you and your people in need. In Christ's holy name, amen. As we prepare to listen to scripture, let us pray. God of mercy, grant that the word you speak this day may take root in our hearts and bear fruit to your honor and glory. Amen. Our gospel reading this morning is a reading from John chapter 20. But Thomas, who is called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But then he said to them, unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands 
and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Oh, children of the church, it is so good to be with you this morning. I know that it's been a long time since we've been in the sanctuary together, but I have so enjoyed our time together during the week on Zoom. And this week, we'll get our, our big friends up to speed. This week, the children and I, during story time, talked about the treasures we have and how they bring us great joy. Some of us had treasure boxes, or some of us, like me, had a special place where I displayed my treasures. The book we read this week in story time reminded us that some of our most special treasures can't fit or go in a box or on a shelf, right? Do you remember, friends? Thumbs up if you remember. Yes, like raindrops and puddles, our families, long walks, holding hands. Remember that with our friends, hugs. Yes, these are types of things that can't fit into boxes or put on shelves. Well, I had asked everyone this week to head out for a walk to look for a new treasure. Well, I hope you were able to go out for that walk this week, but if not, there's still time. Well, I also asked our friends to keep their eyes peeled for treasures. And I hope that if you got to go out on your walk, that you found a new special treasure, one that could fit in your box or put on your shelf. And I hope that that walk, I believe it was probably with either your sister or brother, or maybe a grandparent or a mommy and daddy. I hope that walk is now a treasured memory. Well, I went for my walk this week and guess what? God showed me so much. As I headed out, I grabbed my bag and I filled it with some things. The scripture reading for this week, my glasses, a pencil. You see, I was headed to Licking Hole Basin. That is a very special place, a treasure, which brings me joy. And it's just located out, out my backyard, just about a half mile down on a wooded path. Well, I was headed there because it's quiet and I could read the scripture and listen for God's spirit to help me with the children's message today. Well, the strangest things happened. I was on the narrow path in the woods with my head down. I was reading a note from, from something I had written down and I was very distracted in this note and I wasn't looking all around. When all of a sudden, I was whacked right in the face by a wet tree branch. Yep, it startled me and it hurt a little too. Well, I thought it best to put my note away and keep my eyes peeled. You know, you can get hurt in the woods if you're not paying attention. Well, a few seconds later, guess what, my friends? You're not going to believe me. But guess what I saw? I saw a red fox a beautiful red fox trotting down the trail in front of me. And then of course, you know, he sensed me and he or she went scurrying off into the deep woods. It was beautiful. It was such a wonderful sight. You do not see well, 
well, at least I do not see a fox that often. So it was an incredible sight to me, and this became a treasured memory. So you may ask, what does this have to do with the story of Thomas that Mr. Skip just read? Well, here's what I think. Thomas has a nickname named Doubting Thomas because at first he did not believe Jesus was alive and he needed to see Jesus to believe. I think Thomas gets a bad rap for doubting. I have to ask you, when daddy tells you one more minute when you need him, do you believe it'll actually be really one more minute? Or when mommy tells you she'll be off the phone in five minutes, do you actually believe it'll be just five minutes? I know sometimes you get lucky, but I know you also doubt that this will happen. My friends, we all doubt for different reasons, and it's perfectly reasonable to doubt. So I actually am really fond of this story in the Gospel of John. So I got to thinking, instead of looking up and being alert for God, when I was walking, I had my head down. I was distracted and absorbed in my own world, in my own place. I wasn't looking for God. I wasn't seeing Jesus. And I got smacked in the face by that branch. Well, isn't it something that when I looked up and beyond, I saw something incredible? Well, our friend Thomas was scared. He wasn't sure if he could trust and believe Jesus was alive. And I say, it was quite an unbelievable thing, don't you think? Jesus had died, and now folks were saying what, he was alive. Isn't it something that God gave Thomas a second chance to believe? And that God knew exactly what Thomas needed to believe. Thomas needed to see Jesus, the holes in his hands, the hole in his side to believe. Now Jesus is our special treasure and he comes with many special treasures, but he can't be seen anymore like we can be seen to each other here on Zoom. He's now with God, but by the power of the spirit, he is alive and among us. And it's our job to believe with all our might without seeing him. Jesus tells us that we will be blessed when we have faith to believe. Ah, I see now, my friends. When I believe and I have faith and I keep my head up, God will show me Jesus. When I keep my head up, I will find all the treasures he has for me. Let us keep our eyes on Jesus, my dear friends, because he can make it possible to see God in all things. Oh, let us pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you for second chances at believing. Help our unbelief. Help us to look to you, to draw close to you, so that we can see more of your peace, your joy, your love, and your hope in the world. We pray this in Jesus' name, who is alive and among us. Amen. Amen. Amen, my friends. Before I read our second lesson, let me set some of the historical context for you. The letter of First Peter was probably written around the year 67 AD to help fledgling Christians who were dealing with very difficult ordeal. Their ordeal was not what we are going through right now or anything we are accustomed to. They were being put to death for having faith in Jesus Christ. First Peter was written to Christians scattered across the northeast corner of Asia Minor, encouraging them to be strong and to endure in their faith. Listen to this reading. I'll be reading First Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 9. I'm going to be reading from the message, Eugene Peterson's translation. What a God we have and how fortunate we are to have him, this father of our master Jesus. Because Jesus was raised from the dead, 
We've been given a brand new life and have everything to live for, including a future in heaven. And the future starts now. God is keeping careful watch over us and the future. The day is coming when you'll have it all, life healed and whole. I know how great this makes you feel, even though you have to put up with every kind of aggravation in the meantime. Pure gold put in the fire comes out of it proved pure. Genuine faith put through this suffering comes out proved genuine. When Jesus wraps this all up, it's your faith, not your gold, that God will have on display as evidence of his victory. You never saw him, yet you love him. You still don't see him, yet you trust him with laughter and singing. Because you kept on believing, you'll get what you're looking forward to, total salvation. May the Lord add his blessing to these words. One of the questions that Easter poses for us is this. What did Jesus accomplish for us by his life, death, and resurrection? But you know something, the earliest disciples were not pondering that question when they were huddled in fear on Good Friday and for the next day until Easter morning. My guess is they wondered what had gone wrong. Why had Jesus, their friend, such a, suffered such a terrible death? What could have been done different? And what were they supposed to do next? That was what they were thinking for those three days. Easter changed all of that though. As they tried to make sense of their friend raised from the dead, they forgot all those things that had worried them for those three days. What did Jesus' resurrection mean? What did it mean for them? What did it mean for Israel? What did it mean for all of creation? Easter turned every earthly question on its head. What seemed of such great concern a few days earlier no longer was a concern. The darkness of evil and death were no match for the goodness and the light of God made visible, made real in this world through his risen son. I completely understand why the church eventually redefined the marking of time based upon the lifespan of Jesus. Because of the resurrection, there really was a sense in which the world could be divided into time prior to Jesus and time after Jesus was here. The resurrection was and is an event of that magnitude, that world altering magnitude. It would be silly, though, to suppose the earliest disciples jumped straight from the amazement and exceeding joy of Easter to contemplating what did Jesus' life, death, and resurrection do for them and for this world. A systematic explanation evolved over years, generations, millennia. By the time 1 Peter was written, at least 30 years had elapsed, 30 years of the church gathering for worship, 30 years of the church thinking about, praying about, suffering for, struggling with, and witnessing to the resurrection. To the question, what did Jesus' life, death, and resurrection accomplish? The author of 1 Peter wrote this, by his great mercy, God has given us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading. When First Peter was written, Romans were putting Christians to death. The darkness of evil and suffering seemed to be as real as ever. 
It surely didn't look like the sting of death had been defeated. In the face of fierce persecution, the faithful were told there were more, there was more of life than that which can be seen and experienced. And this they believed with all their hearts and strength because of the power of God's spirit at work in them. Those people in power who set bloodthirsty dogs on Christian men, women, and children thought suffering and death were the worst that life had to offer. They thought there was nothing worse that could be done. And to be sure, what was done to those poor folks was unspeakably awful. What those people in power didn't know, though, was that because of Jesus' resurrection, the faithful were given new birth into a living hope. A hope not even hatred, torture, and death could erase. What the persecutors didn't know was that the followers of Jesus possessed an inheritance given to them by God. And to that inheritance, they clung, they clinged with all their might. Would you have the same sort of courage and hope and assurance in the face of angry dogs and the threat of being burned alive? Do we have the same sort of courage and hope and assurance in the face of the coronavirus? Consider with me having faith in Christ and what that gives to us and what faith in Christ costs us. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, a German Lutheran theologian, martyred by Adolf Hitler just before the end of the war in 1945, said the cost of faith was one's life, that Christ bids us to come and die writes Bonhoeffer, the grace, God is cost, the grace of God is costly because it calls us to follow, and it is grace because it calls us to follow Jesus Christ. It is costly because it costs people their lives, and it is grace because it gives people the only true life. For us, often faith is not costly at all. Can you think of a way in which living out your faith is even an inconvenience? The fact is that for many card-carrying Christians, if faith in Jesus requires much, then forget it. Adult Christians of this tepid form of discipleship wonder why. So many young people can find no reason to care about church or about Christianity. Poet Anne Weems thinks the good news of Easter was meant for more than this. It was meant, as she said, to call brittle bones to leaping and stone hearts to soaring. Brittle bones to leaping and stone hearts to soaring. The cross and resurrection were meant to give us the courage and the confidence to set caution aside, to live our faith boldly, to care deeply when budgets and policies make life more difficult for the old, the poor, the children, the immigrant those who are impaired mentally and emotionally, those who have no voice, the very people Jesus spent time with. The Easter message was meant to fill us with joy and zeal. And what did the passage say? Laughter. It was meant to give us the gumption to say no to evil and yes to goodness. It was meant to give us perspective the kind of perspective that frees us to live as people who know the end of life story before the end comes. The kind of perspective that lets us with gusto sing with Martin Luther. Let goods and kindred go, this mortal life also. 
the body they may kill, God's truth abideth still. His kingdom is forever. Yes, Easter gives us the kind of perspective that lets us know God has given us an inheritance. And that inheritance means no matter what happens to us, as we join God at work in this world, nothing can separate us from God's love and God's care. Nothing can keep Christ from taking us to himself. It is because of this glorious inheritance we do not fear when trouble comes, when the earth seems to change, when it seems that the mountains shake in the heart of the sea. Easter was meant to give us new birth into a living hope. That hope says, trust God more than we trust ourselves. It says, give glad thanks that we can trust God is hanging on to us by the hair of the head where we cannot even see or reach it. Along with those earliest Christians and people of faith through time, we cling to this inheritance with all of our might because our lives depend upon it. Let me share with you an interesting analogy in this regard. It comes from John Mortimer, an English lawyer who became a playwright, novelist, and created the Rumpole series for the BBC. Mortimer once asked a gray-haired, bearded yachtsman if sailing on the English Channel was not a dangerous sport. Not dangerous at all, said the man, provided you never learn how to swim. Mortimer asked, what could he mean by that? It seemed to him that the ability to swim would be a good and prudent thing. The old sailor replied, when you're in a spot of trouble, if you can swim, you try to strike out for the shore. You invariably drown. As I can't swim, I cling to the wreckage, and they send a helicopter out to get me. That's my tip. If you ever find yourself in trouble, cling to the wreckage. Now, this may seem like good advice, but an odd analogy. Yet, if we are wise, isn't the inheritance we are given by God, something to cling to with all of our might in good times and bad times. Now, I don't mean to say that the inheritance is something like wreckage, which is why Mortimer's story is not a perfect analogy, but it seems to me the point remains. All the plans we are in the business of making are continually being upset by disaster and by delight. Why can't we see that the life Christ wants for us is not about our ability to be in control, to make life easy or comfortable or certain or safe. It is not about getting to the top or staying at the bottom. It is about clinging to God with all of our might. At the top of Christ's wish list was for us to be God-loving, neighbor-loving people. But we can't do this unless we cling to God. Out of fear, out of greed, out of boredom, we lash ourselves to things that don't really matter in the long run, what we might call fool's gold. And each lash is like one of the thick hairs that nick Gulliver to the ground. Their sum total keeps us solidly tied down. When we cling to the wrong things, when we think we can live without God, we invariably drown. Writer Anne Lamott suggests that maybe God's grace is the unseen sounds that make us look up. Maybe she's right. Trusting that our hope is in God alone and living with this awareness may make us more attentive to those unseen sounds Lamont was talking about. 
It may give us an ear for God. Clinging to Christ may give us the kind of hearts able to love God, our neighbor, ourselves, and God's creation. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. By his great mercy, what God accomplished for us was new birth into a living hope for, through the resurrection of his son from the dead and into an inheritance which is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading. To this good news, may we cling with all of our might. Amen. Let us turn our hearts and minds to prayer using words from the Celtic Psalms of David Adam. As the day dawns, we rejoice that the sun is risen. Christ, come to us. Destroy the darkness of death. Disperse the clouds of night. Warm our hearts with your love. Guide our travels with your light. Let us walk with you as children of the day and not the night. In your light, this day we shall see light. We welcome you, giver of hope and life, conqueror of death and hell. We rejoice in you and in eternal life. Alleluia. By the power of your resurrection. Risen Lord, lift us. By your conquering of death. Risen Lord, lift us. By the triumph over the grave. Risen Lord, lift us by your descending into hell. Risen Lord, lift us. By your appearing to Mary. Risen Lord, lift us. By your peace offered to the disciples. Risen Lord, lift us. By your abiding in Emmaus. Risen Lord, lift us by your forgiveness of Judas. Risen Lord, lift us. By your accepting of Thomas. Risen Lord, lift us. By, by your presence ever with us. Risen Lord, lift us. Come Lord, come to us. Enter our darkness with your light. Fill our emptiness with your light. Come, refresh, restore, renew us. In our sadness, come as joy. In our troubles, come as peace. In our fearfulness, come as hope. In our darkness, come as light. In our frailty, come as strength. In our loneliness, come as love. Come, refresh, restore, renew us. Abide with us, risen Lord. Abide with us today. Abide with us in the brightness. Abide with us in our strength. Abide with us in our weakness. Abide with us in our joys. Abide with us in our sorrows. Abide with us tonight. Abide with us in the darkness. Abide with us in light. Abide with us in death. Abide with us in time. Abide with us for eternity. And now as Jesus taught us to pray, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done 
on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our hymn is Christ is Alive. Following the benediction, you are invited to sing together. Take the love of God with you as you go. May the spirit of the living God present with us here and there fill us with joy and peace and believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, we may all abound with hope. Amen. Grace and peace, everyone. You are unmute. I'll leave the meeting. I'll let that. Yeah. It was a great meeting. It's amazing that you could put this all together. Hi, Charlie. 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 Hi,
Okay. Have a safe week, everybody. Not copy and run. Harry and Dave enjoy your week. Great to see you all. Hey, Mr. Hey. Mrs. Hastings, how you doing? I go find my mama. I'm Bruce and Cheryl. Good job, Kellyanne. Kids are. Not in way, Michael. That was a good week. Hi, Mary, Mike. Mike and Mary Ann. Yes. Flowers <laughs> iPad. Hi, Ann. Hi, Poppy. Hi, Ann. Hi, Ann. Hi, Ann. Hi, Ann. Uh, to <laughs> well, I see the bow tie. I like the bow tie. <laughs> Thank you. Kitchen food. Hi, kitchen crew. Well, hey. Hey, Rich. Hi, Rich. Hi, Susie. Hi, uh, I love the bow tie. Yes, yes. Very Thank, Thank you, sir. <laughs> Poppy, your bow tie is pretty nice too. <laughs> I had to get more dressed up than he was. I didn't look this good when we started. Becky, <laughs> in from San Francisco. Hi, Doug. Hi, Doug. San Francisco. Hi, Doug. Hi, Doug. Hi, Doug. How about it, too? Yeah, I miss my choir. Man. <laughs> uh, well, they, they were on to start with. Uh, pants and saw you, I saw you on early. I like the desk. I know, the desk is fun. Hi, Mary, I'm happy. Hi, Joe. Have a great week. Hi, Joe. I think it is. I think it is. It oh, is. Yeah. 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 Right. Carolyn Worrell. Hi, Mary, I'm happy. Good luck. Good luck. Elsie Winston. Elsie Winston. Okay. Where are the cookies to go with coffee hour? I'm going to get that going. I'm going to get that going. Okay.